All right, so the really good news is I've got some really cool stuff on evolution. Bad news is it's not baked yet. You won't see it till January. So in the meantime, I'm going to try and knit together three big themes that have been going on at TED, and then do something really stupid, which is actually say what part of this might mean for the next 30 years. So as you knit these things that don't go together together, I'm going to bring together networks, robots, and 3D printing. And you've been hearing about that this TED, this morning, this session, last year. And as you're thinking about the impact of these things, the first thing you've got to talk about is how it affects people. Because there's a management bromide out there that people are the most important part of any organization, and you start every HR meeting with this, and you talk about it. But how you organize people has really changed. So if you think about the guild system back in the 1500s, how you organize people was in these little tiny cells, in these concrete units. You did not want to spread information. You wanted to keep it tight. You wanted to keep it really secret. You didn't want people to know how you made those textiles. As you begin to move technology forward, then you organize people in these long lines, and they become interchangeable. And instead of people really mattering, it's engineering, logistics, time, and you get a 50-fold increase in output. So that different way of organizing people, moving from these little cells into very long things, actually really works. Then in the 1960s, you have a corporate structure that begins to reflect that. So it really doesn't matter who organizes or who sits in those boxes. You can move people from this geography to that geography, this function to that function. The lead books are talking about the organization man, primarily because it was all men wearing wingtips with one woman, and white shirts and blue suits. And as you go forward in that, you have a whole series of workers who actually hate it when something goes wrong. Now you're organizing people in a different way, and in a knowledge economy, you actually love it when things go wrong because then you can build and change and make things in networks, and you begin to organize people based on how are you and where are you in this network. And this is the Christakis Fowler stuff you've seen over the last few years. So there are key bridges, there are people who are highly influential, there are clusters of people, and you can map every doctor in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, and how they interact, and you can do the same thing for undergraduates. And you've seen this chart, so it's who gets the flu, how quickly is it contagious, and the same thing is true for products and services. But that is a completely different way of organizing people, and if people matter, they matter in a very different way today from the corporate 1960s. So where it gets interesting is when you begin to plug in these technologies. So all of a sudden, what you're doing is you're taking this non-hierarchical networked economy. And you're beginning to plug in these 3D printers that we've been hearing about that can make very sophisticated objects, and you're beginning to get these maker cafes, and people are beginning to really be able to print in paper, or to print in wood, or to print in plastic, or to print in metal. So you have a very different networking structure, very different hierarchical structure with the new technology coming in, and then you add the third thing, which is robots. So the stuff that Rod Brooks is doing is incredibly important. Because it's the first uncaged industrial robot, which means you can get between the car and the robot, and it won't take your head off. The second thing is he's shipping it for twenty two thousand bucks. The third thing is it doesn't take a PhD to program it. So in my own strange mind, you take these network economies and you begin to put them together, and all of a sudden your core R and D starts decentralizing out of these organizations, so you can have innovation and new designs way at the edges of this thing. You can have an entirely different manufacturing base, and oh by the way, your customers become designers as well, which is why you now have a cup holder in Tesla. And the file is uploaded, and you download it. And what that means in very practical terms is that this kid can show up in your office and say, "I'd like to build a flying car." And you kind of say, "All right, take a number." Right? Sure, you're going to build a flying car. I mean, it took General Motors X time and X years to do this thing, but of course, he comes back four years later, proves you wrong, and builds a car, which of course you can order today. And for everybody with purple tags, it's much cooler to drive up to the hotel lobby in one of these than a Tesla. So as you're thinking about this stuff and the implications of these things, here are five major changes that I think are going to take place, because we're organizing society in a different way, because we're bringing robots into it, and because we're able to print in three dimensions. So change number one 
network forces are going to begin to overwhelm corporations. You keep your corporation organized in that structured hierarchical way, you're toast, because the network is just going to eat you. Second big change, 3D printing and robots are going to decentralize manufacturing and design. That core R&D department that would design something for five years and then send it off to corporate and it'd go through all those things and then it'd go to the fair and then it would be on the shelf in three or five years, that's going to be completely overwhelmed by customers if the company doesn't do it itself. You're going to get a very fast build and redesign. The cost of making things is going to drop radically. So if you can plug these three technologies together, it really doesn't matter if you're making a Bic pen or a Mont Blanc pen. And that's part of what makes this design stuff so interesting, because the manufacturing is fundamentally going to change. And then the last thing is, the US and the EU might become low-cost manufacturing centers. Because all of a sudden, how you make stuff, where you make stuff, may not be a maquiladora in Mexico, it may not be China, it may not be India. And what's really interesting about this stuff is there's these three or four or five really big underlying themes kind of wandering their way through TED. And as you begin to knit those things together, you're going to see some very, very large-scale changes in how we organize society and who's rich and who's poor and how things actually happen. Thank you very much.